Hi everyone and welcome to today's OTS webinar. Uh, so I'm one of your hosts, my name is Erin and Ronald is um, my co-host. And today we're featuring our first trainee spotlight uh, with Jakob Young and Sarah Overby. Um, so what we'll do is we will have uh, Jakob speak first and then Sarah. Um, and so we'll let them introduce themselves so we have enough time to get through everyone's questions. If you have questions today for our speakers, you can either put them in the Q&A or you can put them into the chat function uh, and we'll be moderating um, the question period. So you can just type, type them out as the, the uh, talk is going forward uh, and then we'll get to them at the end of the talks. So Jakob, do you wanna take it away? Um, yes, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Erin. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. So. I hope you can see it right now. Yeah, um, we can see it, take that, great. Yeah, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> so thank you uh, for introducing me and also for inviting me to present my work here. Um, I've seen actually a few of those recent webinars here at OTS and I saw that they mainly cover antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs to fight human and genetic diseases inside mammalian cells. But today I would like to show you a little bit of a different example of how to use ASOs because we, we use them to kill bacteria and use them as novel antibiotics. And during this talk, I will explain to you how to design those bacterial ASOs and show ways to identify on and off target responses to those antibiotics. So let's start with a brief introduction on the topic. So uh, a little bit of an introduction why it is extremely important to look into novel methods to kill bacteria. So ever since the introduction of antibiotics, um, resistance has emerged because bacteria are really, really quick to adapt to environmental stresses. And they can also use a wide variety of different mechanisms to become resistant to antibiotics. So for example, they can use um, efflux pumps to pump out antibiotics, or they can modify their cell envelope um, as shown here in order to, um, to get rid of the antibiotics before they even are able to enter the cell. Um, so for example, uh, so in general, often bacteria become resistant to multiple antibiotics. And if they're then treated with the wrong ones, they can lead to death, such as in the time before the invention of the first antibiotics. So, so far it was actually pretty difficult to get into global numbers of death caused by AMR bacteria. But quite recently, there was this massive study published in the Lancet in which they used global data from all over the place. So from literature, hospitals, civilian systems and other sources and covered in to a total of 471 million individual records actually to estimate a lot of different AMR related stats. So it's a really cool study actually. And they have a lot of nice uh, figures also involved. Um, and they, amongst, among other findings, they estimated that 1.27 million people um, were directly killed uh, by resistant bacteria in 2019 alone, which is actually more than, for example, malaria or HIV and AIDS. So we can see that it's already a huge global threat. And if it and it does, even though it does not spread as quickly as other diseases like the coronavirus, for example, it spreads more slowly and often more unnoticed, but it's still there. And that's why it's actually often called the silent pandemic as well. And to forecome this uh, silent pandemic, um, we really need to combine forces uh, such as uh, political decisions, but also economical changes and collaborations with basic research to uh, create new antibiotic classes, which are widely needed. Um, and one such initiative uh, I am actually happy to be part of is BiRescue.net. So this is an initiative funded by the German state of Bavaria in which um, various research groups around Bavaria, different locations teamed up to develop uh, novel strategies against AMR pathogens. So if you're more interested into the specific sub projects of this, um, yeah, of this initiative, you can have a look at the website, which is actually biorescue.net. Um, and here in Würzburg, actually, we are part of the subgroup Arbiotics, um, headed by uh, Jörg Vogel, Lars Barquist, and Franziska Farber's groups. Um, and we look into a digital approach to apply novel RNA targeting antibiotics uh, to fight diseases. Um, so let me briefly introduce you to the um, to the 
type to this type of RNA targeting antibiotics. So the problem with most uh, clinically available antibiotics is that they are broad spectrum. So for example, if you have a bacterial infection inside your gut, uh, the normal treatment is uh, to apply a standard antibi antibiotic. But these antibiotics would not only kill the pathogen, but they would also kill a large amount of other microorganisms, which are often very beneficial and have important functions inside the body, for example, in combination um, with the immune system. And this, uh, this uh, large scale depletion of species can then lead to diseases like Crohn's disease or gut, general gut inflammation, but also to secondary infections such as Clostridium difficile, which is a really, really nasty bug, um, which can make use of the free space, basically, that it's uh, freed up by this broad spectrum antibiotic. So now a perfect antibiotic, on the other hand, would specifically kill the pathogenic bacterium, so that's marked here in green, while leaving the other microbiome unharmed and leaving the gut in a functional uh, state in a good microbiome, basically. And there have been a, a lot of few quite a few different approaches to achieve this uh, species specificity. For example, some groups tried it with uh, CRISPR systems to target specific bacteria or phage therapy. So phages are those um, viruses that only infect uh, bacteria um, to also get rid of specific bacteria. But my group here in Würzburg at Institute of Molecular Infection Biology, uh, we are working with antisense oligomers or specifically peptide nucleic acids. So Peptide nucleic acids are basically single-stranded uh, DNA mimics with a modified backbone. So they basically look similar to single-stranded DNAs or RNAs, but the backbone is unlike in DNA, where we have the sugar phosphate backbone. It is a peptide backbone, which uh, couples together the different bases. And the cool thing about those is that they are still able to bind single-stranded DNAs and RNAs with even a higher affinity. And also they are stable to um, or resistant to nucleases, so they can actually survive very well in bacterial cells. Uh, and in comparison, RNAs would be easily be degraded by nucleases. So the mechanism of action of those PNAs are is shown here basically in this figure. So PNAs cannot be cannot uh, traverse the bacterial cell envelope without anything else because they're, they don't have any charge. They cannot really penetrate the cellular membrane. Uh, so they are coupled to short uh, cell penetrating peptides, uh, which are often uh, positively charged. And once they are coupled to those small peptides, uh, they can actually uh, pass the bacterial membrane and enter, um, and enter the bacterium. So once they are inside the bacterium, the, the PNA gets free and binds to the ribosome binding site of a mRNA of a gene of interest. So this happens by Watson and Crick, standard Watson and Crick base pair ring rules, basically. And once this ribosome binding site is bound, um, the ribosome cannot uh, initiate translation. And if this gene is then an essential gene, it leads to cell death while leaving uh, other microorganisms that don't have this gene basically unharmed. Um, so that would be actually the best case. So. Um, the first question when we started to doing this project uh, two years ago is how can we actually uh, measure bacterial responses to PNAs and how can we see which cell penetrating peptide is the best um, to target specific bacteria. Um, so we came up with this study that has been published uh, last year actually, in which we actually did a exactly this to look into different cell penetrating peptides and see uh, how the bacteria react to it. Um, and for this, we designed a tenmer antisense PNA to the essential gene of ACPP in Salmon Salmonella typhimurium. So that's basically the strain that we usually work with. Um, and we already knew that ACPP is a very potent target to, to antisense PNAs. And we fused to this PNAs a bunch of different carrier peptides to see which carrier peptide is basically the best or which, uh, which delivers the peptide, uh, the, the peptide nucleic acid the best into the bacterial cells. And firstly, we could find that those three peptides down here did not lead to an efficient, efficient growth inhibition. Only the three peptides, KFF, RXR, and TAT, were actually 
uh, potent at delivering it into the cell. And how do we actually get a read out of this is it's basically a very, very simple way that is done in many antibiotics. So we measure the MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentration of uh, this specific antibiotic, uh, which is enough to inhibit growth completely. Um, and we always designed uh, for our experiments the target PNA, so that's the PNA that targets the essential gene, then a scrambled PNA, as, which serves as a control, which does not target any gene, and then the peptide only to sort of see the, this, the peptide, this carrier peptide's effect uh, without any PNA attached to it. And when we, when we look into the growth curves of those uh, bacteria, we can see that uh, there is a growth-dependent uh, growth inhibition of our target PNAs. Uh, for both KFF, RxR, and also TET um, peptide. And actually, KFF, uh, the KFF coupled uh, PNA, inhibits best, and it has a MIC, a very low MIC of 1.25 micromolar only. And when we look into the scrambled control and the peptide only control, we cannot see any effect uh, on growth uh, of both the scrambled and the KFF alone, uh, which is actually different to the RxR and the TAT peptides, which show like a slight um, growth, uh, yeah, a slight growth defect when, especially when we apply very high concentrations of the PNA constructs to it. Um, so yeah, those are actually the standard uh, experiments that always are being done with antibiotics, but we wanted to do something else and we wanted to actually see how the cell or the bacteria responds to those PNA antibiotics. And for this, we developed this new uh, pipeline in which we apply our bacteria to our um, peptide PNA constructs for like 15 minutes with a very high concentration uh, to sort of see how the cell reacts to this short-term uh, shock of PNA treatment. And then we did RNA sequencing to analyze the, the target and off-target effects of it. And the results uh, look like this, and it's actually an interesting result. Because, um, well, actually, I forgot to show, to show the x and y axis, but the x axis of these volcano plots always denotes the log twofold up regulation or down regulation. So the left ones are all the down regulated genes of Salmonella, and the right ones are the up regulated genes compared to the untreated samples. And on the y axis, you can see the negative uh, log 10 of the p values. So the higher, uh, the more significant gene is down regulated. And what it's really jumping into the eye right directly is that ACPP, which is the target gene, is significantly uh, downregulated. So the mRNA is also depleted. Not only the translation is inhibited. And that was actually really cool. And we, we figured that we could use this um, large scale sequencing as a readout for measuring target and off target effects of those PNAs. And another thing that jumped to mind is also that there are a lot of genes actually upregulated significantly in the RxR and TAT conjugated PNAs, um, which shows that those uh, two peptides probably have a, uh, or uh, generate a much stronger reaction of the bacterium to these PNA uh, constructs. And another thing that we have found out, but I'm not going to talk much more about it here, is that of those upregulated genes, so VIRK and MIG14, uh, most of them are part of an envel envelope stress response, which is possibly caused um, by the CPP PNA construct entering the, ce the cellular membrane. Um, so, to yeah, to summarize this first um, publication is we have established this pipeline in which we showed that um, KFF is the best carrier peptide. And we showed that uh, you can use the target and off-target effects using MIC experiments together with RNA-seq experiments. And we used this pipeline also in the upcoming, uh, result, in the upcoming uh, results that I'm going to show you. So the th second thing that we were asking ourselves uh, was how to find the perfect target gene. Because remember, uh, we only targeted ACPP, which we already knew by previous studies that it's a very good uh, and potent target gene. And first, um, and, and yeah, we have also this pub, the study, we have it now um, in bioarchives. So if you're more interested in, in it, you can read it. And we first 
asked ourselves whether the transcript level, so the transcription or expression of a gene, is might be indicative of the if of the, if of its potency as a PNA target, because ACPP is an extremely highly expressed genes in uh, bacteria. And so we designed a lot of different PNAs that all have different expression levels to sort of see whether this holds true. So whether the, the lowly expressed genes are much worse uh, PNA targets than the highly expressed genes. And we could actually find out that it's not the case. So it's uh, there is no real correlation between the expression level, which is here on the y-axis, and the MICs, which is on the x-axis, um, which was quite interesting to see. Um, but it's probably due to due to the fact that all of those different genes have all different functions. So when you downregulate this gene uh, only a bit and the other gene very strongly, then it might lead to different effects. So that's actually not, not that surprising after all. But another thing that we have found out is that we actually could see um, uh, uh, quite a correlation between the predict predicted melting temperature. So PNAs, when they bind to uh, when they bind to a mRNA, they can, uh, you can basically calculate the predicted melting temperatures or the binding affinity to an mRNA. And we could actually uh, prove that this uh, predicted melting temperature um, and the translation inhibition efficiency uh, really nicely correlate. So RPLS has actually a very low GC content, um, so a very low uh, predicted melting temperature, and it also cannot uh, efficiently inhibit translation. Um, so, yeah, that was. Uh, the second project that I would like to uh, wanted to show to you, and now I'm going to go with the third one, which is actually how to how do we design bacterial antisense oligomers, and that's actually an interesting question because um, there have not been a lot of studies which show you how to exactly design those antisense oligomers. So we know that you have to target the ribosome binding site of a gene, and we know that these ASOs should not be longer than like 13 uh, bases. Um, but we didn't really have some ideas about uh, how off-target effects play into role and other values that we could predict. And that's why we developed this uh, web tool called Mason for make antisense oligomers uh, now. And this web tool is actually done for any experimental researcher that actually has a, um, a target organism and a target gene that he wants to target with an ASO sequence. And then what Mason does, it basically shows you or it generates a bunch of different antisense oligomers, which all align to the ribosome binding site or the start codon of the respective gene. And it also gives you a lot of nice attributes that might be indicative whether the PNA or ASO is efficient. So for example, we have the self-complementary basis, which is actually the, the amount of bases that, are, that might be self-complementary. So if you have a PNA, uh, designed, then it might always bind to itself by Watson and Crick base pairing rules, um, and this is, should actually be prevented. So if there are too many self-complementary bases, uh, probably the PNA is not as efficient anymore. And also some other uh, things like purine percentage, which should be kept rather low, um, and melting temperature, as I have, have shown to you before. Um, and the last thing is actually the off-targets, which is a very interesting metric because there is not much research about off targets um, in bacterial antisense oligomers because um, remember if a pna targets the the ribosome binding site of a specific gene it might also have the bacteria might also have the same region in another gene so it might bind there as well um, so to remind you a little bit of this uh, process is uh, an aso generally binds to the start codon and thereby inhibits translation. Um, and this can actually be found in our, uh, using RNA-seq, which I have shown you before. But what we actually don't know is whether this also happens in off targets, especially when there are one or two base pair mismatches induced in the antisense oligomer. So often these off targets have like one or two base pair mismatches and they are usually, or in older studies, they have always been neglected, but we were thinking that it might actually be also uh, possible that it still is able to downregulate those cells. And that's why that led us to improve, uh, uh, that led us to design an experiment um, with a bunch of different mutated PNAs. So again, we have the ACPP target PNA that we already sort of know that it works. And then we designed nine different uh, 
um, mutated PNAs that all have two base pair mismatches in different uh, locations. Um, and then we applied our standard pipeline to them to see whether they re can retain efficiency even though they have those two mismatches. Um, and what was actually very interesting when looking into the MIC measurements, so here on the uh, upper hand side, you can see a heat map with the MIC values, um, was that the target PNA without any mismatches still has the lowest MIC, which sort of makes sense. But mismatch 9 PNA and mismatch 1 PNA, who both have um, two mismatches in either of the termini, have still a quite low MIC of five uh, and five respectively. Um, and that was actually quite a, quite a cool finding. And it also means that only eight mer or eight consecutive matches might actually still already still be able to downregulate uh, translation of the specific gene. And we could actually also prove this um, using our RNA-seq data, because here we can see um, for ACPP and FabF, so FabF is always uh, co-regulated with ACPP. Um, you can see on the y-axis the log two fold uh, change down regulation. So the higher, the more down regulated the, specific, uh, the, the genes are in this, in this respective uh, sample. So again, the fully matching PNA has the strongest down regulation, but then also mismatch one, mismatch eight, and mismatch nine PNAs are still able to uh, deplete the mRNA of this. And it, that, that was actually a cool finding. And it actually means that maybe we could also design shorter antisense oligomers with only eight or seven uh, uh, bases included on. But remember, I. Uh, I showed you that we have a whole transcriptomic data set, not only this, uh, but looking into all of the genes of, of the whole Salmonella for nine different conditions. And using this global data, um, we looked into all the possible off targets which have uh, mismatches inside themselves. And we wanted to see whether we could uh, approve sort of the finding that we had before. So in this case, in this plot, we can see um, at position five, basically, uh, all the PNAs that have a, all, all the genes that have a mismatch at position five with respect to an off target gene. And of all of those mismatches, uh, actually 30% were down regulated significantly. Whereas um, when mismatches are in the center of the PNA, um, they are less, much less likely to be down regulated. And that, that led us ba basically um, to, uh, to implement this into Mason, so into our pipeline, um, in which we chose to um, to only consider off targets as off targets if they have um, a matching base stretch, uh, a matching base stretch of at least seven consecutive uh, base pairs. And we could also see with, uh, proof with p-values that um, the, the, the longer the match, uh, the more likely uh, significant down regulation of an off target gene is. Um, so, to, yeah, to sort of uh, visualize it a little bit better, um, this in Mason is not called an off target because it has a mismatch inside the center of the PNA. And this one, in, in turn, would be classified as an off target because it has those two mismatches in the outside um, of the mRNA. And um, yeah, that was actually our data-driven design mechanism of, uh, of Mason. And on the website, it actually looks uh, like this. And the website should be uh, actually updated or online right now. So you can actually uh, uh, look at it right now. Uh, and yeah, that was actually the last part of my talk. Um, so to summarize, I've shown you how you can use growth measurements and RNA-seq to decipher both on and off target effects of PNAs. Um, I introduced you to this Mason web tool, uh, which helps you in guiding uh, the ASO design and using a data-driven off-target prediction algorithm. Um, and the third thing that I have not really talked about yet, but I would like to mention it really quick because it is, is it, it is another uh, sequencing tool that we have established, which can also uh, look into the effects of translation initiation uh, inhibition, which is called InReSeq. Um, so it actually makes use of, um, of ribosome profiling to look into the translation inhibition of uh, PNAs. Um, and it's a preprint that came out actually last week. So if you're more interested into this topic, you can also uh, read this from now on.
So with that, I would like to stop and thank you for listening firstly, uh, and also the Jörg Vogel group who did all the experiments basically for me. So especially Linda and Tao, who are the experimentalists who stand behind all this data. Um, and then also Lars Barquist and his group um, who are the bioinformaticians who I could always ask inside the office for help and guidelines. So thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I guess you have already written it into the chat or otherwise, if anything else comes up, you can send me an email uh, using this mail or use some other media. So thank you very much. And I'm now ready for the question session. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jacob, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. It's a uh, it's it's a bit different than uh, than others that presented. I uh, I agree on this, but it's, uh, it's very nice work. So actually, my first question is on your uh, uh, growth inhibition essay. Um, so to test the uh, ASOs, you you look at uh, I think that your primary outcome measure before you do the RNA sequencing is growth inhibition, but growth inhibition might be caused by a lot of different factors. Uh, so that can also be just toxicity from the uh, from the ASO, and you will assess this at a later moment. Uh, but uh, are there no? Um, is there also like a? Uh, 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 can you measure something directly, more direct, in your essay to prove that you really have an on-target oligo? Um, yeah. So thank you for that question. Um, I guess. Yeah, you were basically asking whether the the killing might be because of the ASO carrier peptide construct itself and not due to the on-target effect, right? Um, so this is actually why we always include a, um, a control um, PNA, which has a scrambled uh, PNA sequence. So this uh, PNA sequence does not target the, or does not bind to the target gene. It is just designed to bind to as least as less uh, targets as possible um, and using those growth experiments uh, i think i have uh, i have it in one of the slides um, of the growth experiments yeah so here we always have the scrambled uh, control and for the kff for example we can see that there is no uh, yeah no inhibition on growth even at high concentrations with the scrambled pna so that's what we firstly use as uh, as an effect um, or as an output um, to prove that it's target specific um, but we also have uh, by now we also have a mechanism or a yeah a way in which we use in vitro translation um, assays to sort of uh, yeah to sort of put together the uh, the mrna sequence together with a pna and run a translation in vitro to sort of see uh, whether the yeah whether the PNA inhibits translation specifically. Yeah. Okay. So one small question, so it can be a very short answer. So for yeah. the scrambled, you just you use a scrambled oligo for all the for all your target sequences, or you just have one random one that you use for the experiments? Oh, we just the, actually oh. use one. Well, it's not actually that random because we always have to take care that it does not ac accidentally target another gene that might be actually have uh, a stronger effect on on the, yeah, on the transcriptome in general. But yeah, so we always use just uh, in these experiments, we just used uh, one scrambled uh, control. Yeah. Yeah, because preferably you want to have like all nucleotides. And then but also when we look, but also when we look into the transcriptome, um, we could not see much difference between the scrambled uh, control um, and the and the peptide itself. So that also actually uh, indicates that there is no, yeah, there are less those uh, unspecific effects basically. Yeah, yeah super. Yeah, I, I also I really like this uh, this uh, Mason uh, application that you can use online. So I think there are a few questions in the chat uh, based on this. So, and I will just combine them into one uh, question. So uh, what are the uh, optimal conditions to use? So does your uh, Mason tool um, give also any information on the on the reader? So for example, what is the optimum TM uh, that you need for the, uh, for the early goes? And are the, what are the other important factors? Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. I mean, I think that's a very important question. Um, so, uh, Mason puts out uh, like a lot of different attributes, um, but we decided not to uh, not to give uh, 
specific, a clear guideline because we, with the data that we have, we know that um, uh, there are a lot of still, still a lot of unknowns. So we we do know that the higher the the higher the melting temperature, the better the translation is probably inhibited. So if you have like a set of uh, 10 different antisense oligomers that Mason created for you, um, you should probably not take the one with the lowest uh, melting temperature because that one is probably less likely to, uh, to downregulate uh, the gene. Um, on the other hand, some other things are very, yeah, very good to, to cancel out sort of candidates. So for example, if, it, if we have self-complementarity of more than four different nucleotides, you should definitely not use this PNA uh, whatsoever. Um, but then there are also other things like, for example, um, this off-target prediction algorithm, which is, in my opinion, very, uh, very important. And it's actually the novel thing in Mason. Um, it always looks into both the, the, the overall transcriptome off-targets and into off-targets that might actually bind to the ribosome binding site of a specific of other genes. And it, it puts out like um, both uh, figures, but also a uh, output table, which uh, specifically shows you the genes um, which might be also affected by this specific PNA. And then it's, it's for the user to decide, okay, this, this and this gene might actually be an important thing that I don't want to downregulate. Um, so to decide sort of in this way, basically. Um, but yeah, in general, also, yeah, for these off targets, there is no general rule. So you cannot uh, just make this uh, assumption, okay, this one is the perfect one. Uh, but on the website, there are actually also some uh, guidelines for uh, written down uh, to give you like sort of a yeah, a bit, a bit of a guide on how these things are calculated and how you should uh, basically choose your um, yeah, your PNA of interest. And also, um, I'm about to make a tutorial video of the whole website um, in which I will, might also give a little bit of uh, additional information on this one. Great, thank you. I think this is a uh, very uh, useful information. So um, uh, we had still have uh, quite some uh, questions in the chat and in the Q and A section. So uh, please, uh, if you have time, uh, please answer the questions. And um, if yep. you think after the webinar, if you have a question for Jacob, just send an email to uh, to Jacob. So uh, Jacob, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Thank you. And then we will move to the to the next speaker of today, and that uh, the Sarah. So uh, Sarah, the screen is yours. Hello, let me see if I can share really quickly. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it works, but it's not in presentation mode yet. Um, how about now? Still not. Maybe try turning the, sh the share off and back on. Mm, okay. It's weird because it is it's in representation mode for me. Mm, let me try one more thing. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, it's yeah. Uh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Yeah, um, Jakob, I just wanted to say your talk was uh, really, really interesting. I haven't seen ASOs used in that way before. So thanks for sharing your research with us. Um, my talk is gonna be much more conventional uh, ASO use. Um, I'm a P I am a recent uh, graduate from University of Valencia. I just defended my PhD in January. And so I've now started a postdoctoral position in another university, but um, I really wanted to share the, I was really excited when uh, Aaron contacted me to, to get to share the results of my PhD because these were also just published in March. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something I definitely want to share with the, the, the OTS community. So without further ado. So um, this, is the use of ASOs in uh, myotonic dystrophy type one. I'm just gonna quickly go over this disease. 
from there. Okay, so um, it comes in two forms, uh, DM1 and DM2, but I'm only going to speak to you today about DM1. It's a multi-systemic disorder that affects between five to 20 and 100,000 people. So it's actually a pretty common uh, rare disease. And because it's a multi-systemic disease, there's different symptoms within many different tissues of the body. You have myotonia and muscle weakness, which is affecting the muscles. It affects the heart and can result in cardiac arrhythmias. You can also have cognitive dysfunction, cataracts, and insulin resistance. There are also different severities of the disease. Uh, you can be born with it or it can uh, become evident later on in life. And there's currently no FDA approved treatment for this disease, making it a, a very relevant for study. The patients of this disease report a very high disease burden as well, that the muscle weakness, fatigue, and pain affect their daily life and their relationships. 84% dif uh, report difficulty walking, and even 3% uh, must use a wheelchair. Uh, the main cause of death for this disease is respiratory and heart failure. And of relevance today, they, these patients are at an increased risk for severe cases of COVID due to their pre-existing conditions of insulin resistance, obesity, and cardiac dysfunction. So I wanna go over the genetic basis of this disease so that we can begin to talk about the therapies for it, uh, which is the exciting antisense part. But in order to get to that, I have to explain how this disease comes about. So the, 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 the origin of the disease is rooted in the DM protein kinase gene or the DMPK gene. And in this gene, we as uh, healthy people have uh, between five to 37 natural repeats of the CTG motif. And this occurs naturally in, in all humans. But when you start to get more than 50 of these repetitions, this is when you start to see pathogenicity uh, a, with a slight correlation as well between uh, the severity of the disease and uh, the number of repeats. So you see the, the severe forms of the disease like um, congenital DM1 and juvenile DM1, they have much, much higher numbers even into the thousands of these repeats in their DM protein kinase gene. And so what's the big deal? So the the, the, the repeats itself are, trans, are transcribed into messenger RNA correctly. But what happens is the messenger RNA forms a secondary structure, a hairpin structure. And this hairpin binds with very high affinity to a family of proteins called the muscle bind family, which you can see here in pink. And uh, as they are trapped into these hairpins, you can see in this uh, image here on the right, this is a uh, a DM1 uh, muscle cell. And the staining here is green for muscle blind. And this is a healthy patient here on the left. And that you see the muscle blind is located dispersely throughout the cytoplasm. Whereas for a DM1 patient, the, the immunofluorescence is solely located in the nucleus. And it's also only seen in these punctate foci. And this is where the MBNL is trapped in that hairpin. We also only see a very slight uh, fluorescence from around the cytoplasm. And this is very important because MBNL has a function of uh, alternative splicing regulation, and this often happens in the cytoplasm. So by being sequestered there in the nucleus, the MBNL and the muscle mite proteins cannot perform their normal function. And their normal splicing regulation are also directly related to the downstream symptoms that we see, for example, the CLCN1 chlorine channel uh, misplicing is directly related to myotonia. Uh, you see INSR misplicing, which is related to insulin resistance, and many more uh, different transcripts that are misspliced. They carry a, a fetal pattern of splicing when they should be carrying a, an adult pattern. And so we'll talk a lot more about these uh, alternative splicing patterns later on, but um, these are what are causing your downstream symptoms. So what therapies are out there today for TM1? Well, as you can probably imagine, the most of them are targeting this toxic hairpin. This getting, releasing the MBNL uh, muscle blind protein is our, our most important 
uh, objective in this disease. And so most uh, therapies of, as of now have been targeting the CUG repeats on the messenger RNA. And this has been done with many different antisense uh, technologies such as CRISPR um, with RNA interference um, and also with antisense oligonucleotides by blocking the CTG repeats or by inactiv or activating the RNA uh, pathway and degrading the repeats. And these are just an example of um, some of the blocking type of ASOs and the cutting type of ASOs that have targeted the, the repeats on the DMPK gene. I have highlighted here this Ionis DMPKRX. This actually went to clinical phase two or phase three clinical trial. I can't remember um, how far it got, but it got very far in um, clinical trial. And this just uh, highlights the importance and the, and the uh, potential for these types of oligos in this disease. So I've talked about the CTG repeats and uh, how they sequester the muscle blind family of proteins, but I wanna talk about uh, another important factor in the disease environment, which is the role of microRNAs. So I'm gonna quickly go over, review microRNAs for those who haven't studied them in a while. A microRNA is a, a very small single-stranded RNA that will bind exclusively to the three prime ETRs of, uh, pre of uh, messenger RNAs. And these help to signal into the transcript whether they should be translated or not into proteins. So when you have a lot of microRNA binding, this usually means a decrease in translation into protein. And so what was, what was published recently last year uh, in December by my colleague was that they looked at different mouse muscles that are, um, trans are models of the DM1 disease. They also looked at IPDM, immortalized um, DM1 um, myotubes carrying uh, up to 1300 CTG repeats. And they also looked at, you can see here, muscle biopsies from patients. And in each of these, they wanted to look at the level of microRNA 218, which is a known, uh, it, it is, it's known to target Mbino 1 and 2 uh, at, from making protein. And they found in, this, uh, in these different tissues that the microRNA 218, uh, not only does it target Mbino 1, but it's also upregulated uh, in DM1. And so this was a very important clue for us to, to look harder at these microRNAs is should we just be focusing on the toxic repetitions or is there another pathway that we can uh, target in order to increase in BNL without having to target the repetitions themselves. And so this is a, a strategy that we wanted to explore and it's just been recently published. Um, and it's called block mirror technology. And so the idea is, like I said, to uh, sort of mimic uh, the, the microRNA in that it, it complementary binds to the same binding site, but instead of signaling to the transcript to, uh, to stop making, uh, to stop translating into protein, it simply blocks it. It, it simply um, blocks it and there's no signaling done. And so the transcript is free to translate more protein and therefore supplement the muscle blind that's lacking in the cell. And so the idea here was to make a block mirror specifically for the site, the binding site of uh, microRNAs that target MBNL1. And in this um, paper, we, we focus on microRNA 23B. And uh, so like Jakob had mentioned, they also use cell penetrating peptides uh, because these are great for uh, increasing cell uh, uptake efficiency. Um, and the base of the block mirror oligos was a PMO um, uh, oligo. And they were, yes, so they were linked with the uh, PIP9B2 uh, as a cell penetrating peptide. And so after treatment, we wanted to test this, we wanted to test this first in treatment for uh, in vitro. And then if, depending on how that went, we wanted to test it in an in vivo model. And so first I'm going to, yes, okay. I wanna show you our in vitro results. So in our lab, we use immortalized um, DM1 fibroblasts, which are um, patient derived. And as you can see uh, I, before, like on panel uh, G, 
that this is a control patient, a healthy patient um, or cell, I mean, uh, that have uh, the normal dispersed uh, fluorescence of MBNL in the cell. And then here on the right, you see the DM1 phenotype, which is um, very, it's a, a not as nearly as intense as the one on the control. We also, as Jakob's uh, lab has done, we used a scrambled control to make sure that there were an unrelated off-target uh, toxic, toxic, toxic effects of the, of the peptide. And uh, as you can see, it, it looks almost the same as the DM1 control. And then finally, you have the PPMO block mirror. And for the rest of this talk, I will refer to it as PPMO just for simplicity. Um, and you can see here after treatment, the, the fluorescence is completely returned and the localization of the MBNL is back to where it needs to be in the cytoplasm. And not only is this increased as, a, as we've seen um, by measuring the pixel intensity, but it's also functional. And this is evidenced by the splicing, uh, the splicing alterations we see here in panel D and E. And in BNL1, uh, in, in transcript in BNL1, the exon 5 is abnormally, uh, is abnormally included in the DM1 phenotype. And this is the control here on the left. You see that the exon 5 is uh, excluded. And in, in, in the DM1 phenotype, we have this uh, darker band up top meaning that this exon has been included aberrantly. And that after treatment with the PPMO, the band here gets lighter and that the exon is back to its normal pattern. And this is the same thing that happens uh, in another uh, disease-related transcript called NFIX, which is uh, related to muscle, uh, muscle strength. And it as well has a, a slight return to, to its normal pattern of of exon expression. So these results were, were very promising in cells who wanted to adapt this for, for uh, in vivo experiments. The main, main thing we had to make sure though was that uh, in transferring these experiments to mice that all of these uh, microRNAs and these microRNA binding sites were homologous between humans and, and mice. And uh, so we used a in vivo luciferase assay in order to confirm these binding sites. And we found that there was a single point, uh, not a mutation, but a, a, diff a single nucleotide difference in uh, the homologous binding site for this PPMO in mice. So uh, you can see here, it's highlighted in red, uh, this, this C nucleotide. But for the most part, uh, the seed region, which is here in bold, is the same, uh, and the microRNA is the same sequence. So we did uh, a deletion of the of the seed region, or a perfect match of the entire microRNA. And so here, this is the gluc C uh, luminescence ratio, and uh, the more the higher the luminescence, uh, the less binding that is happening, and the lower the luminescence, the more uh, specific binding that's happening. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and so you can see here when we delete these, these uh, seed regions, the luminescence goes up, meaning that there's less binding happening in comparison to the wild type that's been treated with the same, uh, with the same microRNA to me. Well, this one in this case wasn't treated with the microRNA to me, but um, with the endogenous expression. And then here in uh, the, the second site that was predicted, it's the same thing that occurs. Um, you see uh, an increase in the luminescence, and, which means that there is, uh, in, in comparison to the wild type, meaning that deleting that region uh, is, is allowing uh, something not to be able to bind, which is the microRNA 23B. And in order to confirm this, uh, because this, in this in this case we were looking at just endogenous expression of microRNA 23B3 23B, we wanted to also do uh, the same experiment, but with uh, expressing a microRNA 23B mimic, in order to confirm that there was uh, increase in luminescence in, in luminescence after deletion of these sites. And this also was seen uh, uh, even with mimic expression. So we were confident that these uh, 
microRNA 23B binding sites did exist in mice on the muscle blind transcript. So we designed a, uh, the same PPMO, but with the one nucleotide difference to account for that and to have higher specificity in mice. Uh, but the seed region, as I mentioned before, is, is exactly the same. Um, and they were injected by tail vein injection uh, to the mice. And these are transgenic mice that express 250 of the CTG repeats in the human skeletal act actin gene. They're called HSA-LR mice. And they model the disease such as uh, having myotonia and muscle weakness. And then uh, on a molecular level, you can see the reduction of MDNL. And so we treated them for four days and then sacrificed and examined the tissue. And uh, before, before I get to that part, I want to mention though, we did a, a before and after study of the grip strength of these mice here in panel A on the left. And so you have FVB, which is the uh, wild type healthy mouse. Then we have PBS, which is the sick uh, HSALR mouse with uh, only treated with PBS as a control. Then you have here the PSC, which is the scrambled C, uh, uh, ASO. Uh, and then finally, the, the actual treatment, which is the PPMO. And after treatment with the PPMO, we can see, and this is normalized to their weight, and this is done uh, into before and after their, their injections, you could see a, a, a huge difference, uh, almost uh, comparable to the same amount of strength that the healthy mice have after treatment with the PPMO. So it was a very exciting uh, uh, parameter that we, we got to see. And then we also wanted to make sure that these were not being uh, any there wasn't causing any added toxicity to the to the mice when treated with the PPMOs. Uh, and so looking here at this uh, heat map, you have in green is the healthy level of just our healthy mice. And here on this first column is PBS. So these are just the HSLR mice only treated with PBS. And as you can see here, they have uh, some things that could be related to the phenotype of their disease, uh, like an increased amylase, um, lowered AST, lower CPK. This hasn't been uh, completely confirmed yet because these are not totally well, uh, not in, in depthly studied for the HSALR mice, but it could be just part of this uh, cohort phenotype. And uh, after treatment with the, the scrambled control and the PMO, we did not see any aggravation of any of these parameters. In fact, it stayed mostly the same um, with even a, a, a bit of a decrease in amylase, which is, uh, is a good sign. So um, no toxicity uh, provoked by the, the PPMO. Okay, and so we, we want to wait. Yes. Okay. So as we said before, we need to, yes, we, we, we want to increase the muscle blind protein, but this is only uh, beneficial to the patient if that muscle blind protein is active, functional, and within the cytoplasm so that it can perform its alternative splicing. And so we check to see if the uh, splicing was restored to its usual pattern, and this was indeed to be true, um, with four different transcripts that are implicated as uh, disease-related transcripts. You have ATP2A1, uh, a CLCN1, which is the related to uh, myotonia, and the rest of these are also uh, related to muscles, muscle weakness. And you can see after treatment, uh, this is, you know, the healthy mouse, the sick mouse treated with PBS, the scramble, and then the PPMO. And then all of these blue cases, you see that they've restored the pattern to almost the healthy level of uh, pattern of uh, splicing. And so this was a very exciting uh, functional result. And here you see uh, just a simple Western of um, the increase in protein, which we expected to see after all the splicing rescue. And another interesting phenotype that happens in mice uh, of this disease is that the 
muscle fibers get these nuclei that tra travel towards the center of the fiber in order to sort of, uh, in a, an attempt to repair itself. And you can see here in the, the sick mouse treated with PBS, the central nuclei here pointed with the arrows, you can see it as well in the scrambled treated mice. But after treatment with the PPMO, the percentage of central nuclei was greatly reduced. And uh, this was having a much, and it had the, the, the morphology of the fibers started to have a much cleaner look like the, the healthy mouse as well. Finally, we wanted to look at how much of this made it to the muscle. Uh, this is extremely relevant for ASOs, as you know, because deliverability is our number one uh, enemy <laughs> in this field. And we're constantly battling the, the, um, the, how we can get the ASO to the tissue of interest and in a specific way. And we were happy to see that it was delivered uh, to the heart, the gastrocnemius, and the quadriceps muscles all in uh, similar concentrations. In this particular uh, model of mice, there is not a heart phenotype, but this is a promising uh, parameter because if we test, if it were to be tested in, a, in another DM1 model mouse that has a heart phenotype, then we know that uh, the, the ASO could potentially get there and have a, a therapeutic effect. Finally, as I spoke before, microRNAs, uh, they target the three prime UTR of transcripts, but we've selected transcripts that target the three prime UTRs of, of muscle blind one and two. But that's not to say that these microRNAs could also be targeting many, many other transcripts that are not related to the disease. So the beauty of the block mirror treatment is uh, it's blocking that site and not degrading the microRNA. And so the microRNA is free to go about and work on and uh, regulate the other transcripts that it needs to do. And so we wanted to show that that was the case here and that the, the block mirror only uh, blocked and did not degrade and that these, uh, here's uh, just three different other transcripts that are regulated by microRNA 23B and that none of these were affected by the, by the uh, treatment. Um, so yeah, this is this was uh, the conclusions of the work that this was a proof of concept that they could be used in mice and uh, that it's a viable and a potential method for a workaround to getting an increase in muscle blind protein without directly targeting the the toxic repetitions and without having the potential off-target effects that that includes uh, and having a more subtle modulation of the, of the amount of this, of this protein. So it'd be great to see in the future if this follows a dose response, if this um, is, is kept over time and how often they need to be injected. I just wanted to quickly, last thing, uh, just show you the, the, this is the state of the clinical status of uh, therapies for DM1. And as you can see, mostly right now in phase two and three are small molecules, repurposed small molecules. But here on the, down in the preclinical on the left here, you see these are all antisense oligonucleotides and the potential that they have in this field and uh, the, the therapy that they could potentially have for patients. So this is my old lab where I did my PhD and I wanna thank them very much uh, and the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for funding um, and I'm currently in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, uh, working on leukemia, but uh, for my postdoc. But um, I, I'm still very much involved and in, uh, and still publishing uh, from my work in my PhD. And yes, uh, I hope I didn't go over. Uh, so yes, thank you very much, and I'll take questions now. And. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, presentation, very nice uh, overview. Um, I was uh, very interested in these uh, repeat expansion uh, diseases, uh, so, uh, so very nice. Um, so we start with a question uh, from the chat. So I think uh, um, sure. I think the uh, myotonic dystrophy gene is one of the largest ones 
uh, throughout our uh, genome. So um, there is a question, so how can uh, a, a 20 to 24 uh, nucleotides, uh, long nucleotides have an effect on such a large gene? Oh, okay, so you're, uh, they're talking about people who have used ASOs to target the DMPK repetitions in the past, I, as from what I understand, yes? No. The myotonic gene, which would be the DMPK gene, how a 20 to 24. Yes. So in this, in my, um, my study here, I wasn't targeting the myotonic gene, of the DMPK gene. I was targeting the three prime UTRs of the muscle blind transcripts. But uh, because, but just to answer this question, um, you can see that even a, an oligo of that size can have an effect on, uh, on repetitions that large, uh, depending on the dosage that you use. And uh, you can see in many past studies that uh, that, that size ASO has a, can have a huge effect, even, even though it's being so small in comparison to the length of DMPK. Yeah, yeah. My follow-up question uh, will be so. So what? What? So I, I think if you look at especially at your first uh, experiments, you saw only saw a, a very small increase of uh, the. Uh, I think it's the uh, exon five inclusion exclusion mm. and rate rise. So the, the 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 difference was not super huge. It not was strong. all the way to one hundred percent, but it was only going up to. Uh, 10% or so. So, so how can, so, so is this all, all what's needed or do you really want to rescue this to 100% uh, mm. supply rescue? So what, what is yeah, needed? That's, that's a great question. Um, I would say we could do better. <laughs> I definitely think it, it can go better because as you can see, when you get to the the mice, the, the, the splicing is uh, uh, completely, almost completely reversed. Um, and I think this is a, this is a question of, of dosage, of delivery, of optimization of uh, because of of the the cell itself in vitro. Because as you can see, the the muscle blind was increased uh, there, and, and you can see in the beautiful immunofluorescence. But I've mentioned before, is that increase mean? Does that mean that's functional MBNL? or is it getting sucked back in and trapped into the repeats once again? And for the most part, it looks like here, uh, they are becoming functional again, but uh, I definitely think there is a margin where this could be improved. I think one of the main readouts in the, uh, it's always these uh, uh, RNA, RNA faulty, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Do you yes. Think this? Is, there, is there a big difference? So for this case, the foci are not in it. So in my strategy, which is the block mirrors, you're going in, in the backdoor method. So we're not targeting the, the DMPK hairpin itself. And so we haven't, you, we don't expect to see a difference in the number of foci because you're increasing the MBNL through uh, an, the, the, another method uh, through the microRNA pathway. And so we didn't expect to see a difference in foci and I haven't measured it, but it would be interesting to know. Um, but I didn't expect to see a difference. <laughs> but but would, that, would that not be one of the main disease mechanisms? So I think one of the main disease mechanisms what people say is RNA toxicity, right? So that you have mm -hmm. these uh, the hairpin, hairpins and these large hairpins can attract all kinds of other proteins as well. So they mm -hmm. might, might also bind still to the, uh, to the large uh, repeats. Yes, and that's for sure a, a possibility. But when we saw the, the photos of the immunofluorescence and that it was so uh, dispersed, we didn't really worry about it. <laughs> oh, okay, that might be a good thing to think about. Is but it could be, it would definitely be something interesting to follow up on. And it would be interesting to know if the, the increase has another feedback loop in destabilizing those those toxic repetitions and releasing them by another way. So yes, this would be a really interesting parameter. Yeah, I have a practical question as well. So you, in, in one of your final slides, you said that you measured the ASO concentration in different kinds of tissues. So what kind of method uh, did you use? This uh, was done by my colleagues. Uh, this was a, an ELISA technique and they have a probe on the ELISA that was able to, I sent them my tissue samples and they were able to probe for the amount of oligo that had been delivered. 
Ah, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 And then we have one final question from the Q and A. Let's see. Uh, you uh, so it's a, a question or a remark, but you you might uh, mm. so you may want to use the TFR ligand to deliver PMO to muscle. Mm. Okay, cool. TFR, I'm not actually sure what TTFR ligand is. TFR ligand. I'm also not familiar in the in the muscle field. So, yeah, uh, might be but good it to, would be cool to, to have um, a tissue specific delivery method because that is. One of the problems with with ASOs is getting it into a high. It's one of the reasons that the the other ASOs in DM one didn't make it through clinical trials because they couldn't get into uh, the muscle at a high enough concentration. A transfin receptor. Ah, okay, yeah, uh, very cool. Yeah, that would that would be cool. Yeah, um, I, that was. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I think also the, now now I see the the comment uh, again. I think it's also people yes. in the Duchenne field are doing the the same. Yes, yes. Well, uh, Aaron, do you want to uh, close the the webinar? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks everyone for attending today. Thank you to our speakers, Sarah and Jakob. Uh, you gave really interesting talks, uh, and it's nice to see kind of the diversity of what's going on with. Um, our kind of junior scientists in the OTS. Um, we really appreciate your speaking today and sharing your work and also the amazing questions from the audience uh, to keep a really interesting dialogue going around um, our community's work. And so we do have some webinars upcoming. So make sure you check out the OTS webinar landing page. Uh, you can see what webinars are coming up. Um, and if you're interested in speaking at a webinar and being featured, please get in touch with us either through the info at oligotherapeutics.org um, address, or uh, you can reach out to myself or Ronald via um, Twitter. We're both on there. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.